Good morning, good morning. Are we up? I can't tell. Until somebody says something, I have no idea if we're up and running. All the buttons go green. Okay, good morning. It looks like another nice day in Tokyo. I haven't looked at the weather report. Looks like blue skies, clear, mild breeze. It's chilly, of course. Last couple of days has been chilly. Tuesday was really, really nice. It was so sunny, warm. And uh, I was a bad boy. I played hooky on Tuesday. I just couldn't stand the idea of sitting here at my desk. So uh, I took off for the day. Didn't open the computer at all on Tuesday. But we're back to it now. Back to it this morning. It looks dark outside, but it's actually nice. It's just the shadow, sun shadow angle at this time of day. So. Yeah, I got out for the day. I paid for it though. The next day, muscles. I walked all day. I got out of here. I just uh, I put a sweater and whatever in my backpack. I said, didn't know how the weather was going to go. Put a few bits of clothes in my backpack and headed for the river and started south. And we've talked about this before. The river, the Sumida River Terrace, it goes all the way down to, uh, to Hinode. Now, it's being extended all the time. It went down to Takeshiba Waters. There's a new bridge now linking to the next terminal. And you can walk all the way down the river, right to the bay. You get to the bay and there's a terrace there and you look out towards Odaiba and the sea breeze is coming in. And there's a bunch of restaurants down there. And then <laughs> I got lunch in one of the restaurants there at the, at the pier at, uh, at Takeshiba. They call, they call it Takeshiba Waters now. I got, a, I got lunch in one of the restaurants there. Get a bit sleepy, what to do? And right near it next is the old garden called Hamariku. I forget the official name for it. It's the old samurai gardens at Hamariku. So it's a great, nice, huge park, massive park. Go and have a nap in a the park there. It's massive. It's, it's the size of massive numbers of city blocks. And every square inch of grass is roped off, you know, the ropes and, and ties, ropes and ties. The gravel paths are there. And it's actually... Whatever, it's a nice oasis in the middle of the city, but it's just, it's so relentlessly Japanese official to me. <laughs> Go through every square inch of grass is roped off. Every tree, this famous tree, that famous tree. Here's where there was a building where the shoguns once drank tea. It's, that's where it was located. Go around the corner, another famous tree, another famous place where there was a building. It's boring beyond belief. It's an oasis, but you can't touch, feel the greenery. There was one place I could see in the distance across the pond where there was greenery up a little hill and there was no no uh, wire around it. So I thought, that's it. That's where I can crash out on my, you know, take a nap. I get across the pond, I get over there and there's no fence, there's no string stopping you from going onto the greenery, but a little sign that says, those who would like to sit on the grass go to, and it had a little code number, go to F7 on the map. And you get your map when you go in the thing. And F7, of course, it's the other side of the park. I go over there. And it's been reseeded, ready for next summer or something. So you can't get in. So <laughs> this massive place. And of course, there's almost no benches. Whatever. Grum grumble, grumble, grumble. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't mean for this to be a grumbling day. But uh, actually, I'm in a difficult mood. I really lost sleep last night. I get to bed upstairs, no problem. Crash. I crash quite early, 10, 30, somewhere around there, no problem. And somewhere just after midnight, and I know what time it was, just after midnight, boom, wide awake. The Kobe Beef Restaurant next door is putting up another sign. I've seen it this morning. It's all finished last night, the construction. It's in a big electric sign. There's lights which will be flashing that say, I forget what it says, Kobe beef, 100% Kobe beef. They did it last night, starting at 12 o'clock, and they put it to the building with, you know, concrete drills. So the concrete drilling and the fastening and the whine of the truck and the cart going up and down, and this started at 12 o'clock. I had to go out there. Are you not supposed to do this sort of thing? But out there in my shorts and shirt, and I'm like, this was it. And it wasn't just me. The lady from across the street, her lights go on. The guy next door came out, Nishinomiya-san. The guy from the Yaksa office, three doors down, up on the third floor, he came out and he's yelling and screaming. Across the street, the hotel, pop, 
pop, pop, lights go on. For two hours, those guys were doing that. Concrete drilling on a wall in an echoing street like this. So I didn't get to sleep till whatever. They finished it just before two o'clock, drove away finally. So I missed my alarm this morning. Luckily for me, there's no pool today. Today's the last day in the month. So the swimming pool, the fitness center's closed. They're closed for deep cleaning on the last day of the month. Someone says that's illegal here. It's illegal here too. Of course it's illegal here. Eight o'clock to eight o'clock is the time for construction noise. When they're making a new building, it's different because sometimes there is stuff that has to go on 24 hours. They're digging for foundations and stuff like this. There are exceptions to the eight to eight rule. They have to apply in advance. They have to get clearance from the neighborhood association, all that kind of stuff. Of course there are ways to do this, but general casual construction, let's just sneak in there and do this. Of course that's illegal. But it's done. They just—they knew they were breaking the rules. It's the same deal, you know. Whatever I've in other fields, I've done this myself. Instead of asking permission, you know the deal. It's the modern ethic. You 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 do it first and get away with it and ask ask what's the expression here? I forget the expression. You know, instead of getting permission to do it, you do it first and then whatever, you know. The print that was on the desk a moment ago. It's it's in our. It's just a normal print for us. It's I I didn't whatever. It's here. It's a batch of prints. These are prints that have come back from my, the printers yesterday. This came back from Mita Murasan. It's in our hunger club. Yeah. So I've asked for forgiveness instead of permission. Whatever. So this is a print. It's mine. I designed this a million, million years ago. It was, it was in my, uh, I think it was in the hunger club that I published back in 2004, 2005. It's now in our catalog. I forget the number. 290 something. 293, I don't remember, I'm sorry. Famous artist, Dave Bull. <laughs> and this is, you know what this is, you don't need my explanation for this. This is the Hiroshi Yoshida sailboats, which is steady solid. We had a batch of these finished, I think they were, they came on the desk, Ishikawa-san finished them about a month ago. And here we are, this is the next batch, we're out of them again. And these are from Ayumi-chan, she wants me to check them. She's broken it down like this. She's got okay with a question mark. I'd like to see a bit more confidence from her on that. And then she's got what she's really calling the questionable group. I don't know. We're not going to inspect these in detail here. I don't know. Oh, it could be, again, there's paper defects or chitty or something. I don't know. And then she's got the group at the bottom that she's calling the NG. The outside printers call these Yare, but she calls it NG. There will be misregistration, yeah. And her first few test prints will be here. So I've got to get to that later today. Then also, we won't be doing this today. This is share certificates. I've got to send out 17 more of the Patreon share certificates today. I've got to be careful. There's names and stuff here. But it doesn't matter, we've got the, I've got the list, all the people, whatever number they're getting, number 335. We are now up to certificate number 351. That's the number that I will be signing and sending out today. So over the years, 2017, my uh, Annus Horribilis, we started the Patreon, and that's, we're now up to 300, what did I say? 351 share certificates. Fabulous, fabulous support. My God. The original part of the Patreon campaign got me an assistant and Cameron came and really helped our business. Then the pandemic came and the Patreon campaign paid our rent for all those years. And now the Patreon campaign is what it is. It's still there. People are still supporting us. And I'm not sure how to re, uh, reassign the funds because we're, you know, we're, we're up and running now. Normal business keeps the business going. So why are we still accepting Patreon money? And to help solve that conundrum, yesterday I went to talk to Asaka Sensei, Asaka Motoharu, one of the carvers here in town. Any printers coming in today? Yes, there's three of them coming in today. Ishikawa sounds up there now. Uh, Rei Chan's coming in, and Dave will be printing this afternoon. I will be printing more copies of this. That's my job this afternoon. So three printers today. 
carving first though. Anyway, so I was talking about Askasan, and I tried to, to put some bricks together and solve. Oh, we have a fun show and tell. Cleaning up my desk. We have a, a fun show and tell today. It's, it's, what's the expression? It's not printmaking as we know it, Jim. But it should be a ton of fun, I think. It's going to be like, what? But it doesn't matter. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Six conversations going on at the same time, I'm sorry. Huh? Asuka Sensei, the carver, he runs Takumi Workshop. I went over there yesterday, uh, Tuesday, I did my walk. I walked down to the river, I told you, tried to get a nap in Hamarikyu. Then after that, I went over to see Asuka, -san, Asuka Sensei, because I wanted to make a proposal to him. We have Patreon money sitting now here, building up in our, in our fund, our trainee fund. Money from Patreon is building up. And I don't have a clear goal for it. Asuka Sensei over there has a business, Takumi Hanga, which is, it's doing what it's doing, but it's not flourishing at all. He's trying to teach people uh, about his traditional carving and printing. You know, Taran-san, the young man who's carving for us, came through Asuka Sensei's place and is still working with Asuka Sensei there. Asuka Sensei is my age, he's 72, and he's struggling with his business. He has no help for his business. When I went to see him yesterday, I knocked on the door unannounced. He was actually closed, but he opens the door. Oh, it's Dave, come in. I get to his bench and it's surrounded by receipts and paperwork and bookkeeping. The guy should be carving wood. He should be teaching people how to carve wood. And he's surrounded by stupid, idiotic paperwork. So we're trying to put two and two together. We need printers here. Asuka Sensei has a little school, a kyoshitsu, to train people carving and printing. We here have no real ability to train people. We're also busy fighting to get the work done. We have no way to train people. So I went over there yesterday to try and make a proposal to him. I said, if, if, big if, if we can get some publicity done here in Japan, either through YouTube or television programs or whatever, if Mokohankan can start some publicity about the idea of we are looking for a new generation of craftsmen. We want some young people who would be willing to give this a go, not to become artists, but to become trainee craftsmen printers. So that would be sort of step one, try and identify some people who would like to give this a shot. Step two, we can't train them here. Step two would be to, to uh, send them over to Askasa. He's already set up. He's got his school. He's got his kyoshitsu. He has advanced students there who could, you know, maybe help him with this. And step three, what's also happening at the same time, is Mokoham Khan pays for this. We've got our trainee premium fund. We've got the Patreon money. So we pay the trainees there because they're still not productive yet. And we pay Asuka Sensei for, for, the, for the teaching. We pay him, you know, the school fees or whatever would be involved. And that would be a fabulous fabulous way to put some of these Patreon funds to real use the way they, they've been intended by the people donating them. So I went over there on Tuesday and then I just I put this put this to him, you know. And he doesn't think it can be done. You really people won't pay for this, you know. I'm like Asuka san I showed him my my, my data. The money is already here. Not only will they pay for it, they have been doing so for years. It's just up to you and me to make this happen. And he sits there surrounded by his pile of massive paperwork and he sees this as not just, as not really an opportunity, he sees it as a kind of another burden. So he wasn't jumping up and down in excitement about this. So I'm going to have to rethink this. I came back here and chatted with some of our staff. How can we reduce that guy's burden? You know, his business is not our business. We can't take over his paperwork, you know. He doesn't want to become part of Mokohanka. That would be an idea. It's just ask him to close what he's doing there. We'll... We'll pay him a good salary to do this stuff. 
But no, he wants to keep his own business open, even though it's struggling and floundering. So I didn't come away full of full of uh, joy and uh, fear. Inertia, eh? Sometimes there's so much inertia in these things. Here will help. So you see the difference, where are we? Might be too far away. Can we get in closer? Yeah, you can see adding the oil highlights it, makes it much more contrasty. So. I was talking about Tano, Asaka Motoharu, uh, the, the last real, the last good traditional carver here in Tokyo. There's a few people carving here and there. There's a couple of others whose names, whatever, I won't talk about, people in the guild, the Kumiya. But Asaka-san, he's the last traditional carver who has good sense and good taste and who wants to do a good job. There is, there's a video out there, on, we've, we've talked, every time his name comes up, Asuka Motoharu, there's people who ask, who is this? Uh, he doesn't have much on YouTube, but there is a video out there on the Vimeo platform about Asuka Sensei. A young lady came and made a documentary about him uh, a few years ago, four or five, maybe six years ago. And I, I, I should have the, the link standing by. I don't remember what it's called. On Vimeo, if you search for, for Japanese traditional woodblock carver or something, it should come up. Really, really nice uh, little video about it. A little bit pretentious, but uh, it works. Somebody might have it. The wood carver. Chicken, thank you very much. You know what to say. Please help yourself to the egg basket. So that's the gentleman that I was talking to yesterday. We consider ourselves good friends. We're the same age. I think he's four or five months older than me. We're both 72. Born in the same year. And uh, he has a lot of respect for, for what we're doing in our work. And I do for him as well. And uh, he trained with the Takamizawa company back in the, well, long before I started, of course. You know, I guess it would have been in the 1980s. And his story is fun. And uh, it's hard a little bit to separate how much has become dramatic, uh, dramatic effect and how much is reality. When he went there, the, the story, as, as I've heard it and as we, we, we know it, when he went to Takamizawa to, you know, to try and get a job as, as a trainee carver, they just blew him off. Either they had enough or, or their business wasn't doing well or, or just whatever. I don't know the deal. They blew him off and he said, no, I want to do this. They blew him off. The standard story, you know, the apprentice banging on the door, the people saying, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. At some point it progressed to the point where they let him in, give you some space, but like, we're not going to pay you, just you're whatever. You're welcome to sit here and watch and fool around and do whatever you want, but like payment, forget it. This is, again, this is the story as we've heard it. So he gets in there, he knuckles down, he's got bench space, he's watching the other guys. There's the older, older carver called Kikuta Kojiro, very respected carver. Now long, 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 long gone, of course. And I guess uh, he picked up what he could pick up from the workshop, and he made a living by going out and delivering noodles on a bicycle. You know, in the old days, the, the kids delivering udon and ramen, they get a bicycle and holding the tray up. <laughs> he loves to tell this story and talk about this. And the story is seven years. He did that for seven years, working there and training there and learning there. And the stuff he started carving started going into production, but still no pay. And he, the way he tells the stories, after seven years, finally they said, okay, look at this, you're doing well. Uh, come on board. And they started paying for the work. How much of that is, is uh, really, really absolutely true and how much is legend, I don't know. But it's, it's there. He had a hard, strong, traditional upbringing. And I guess that's uh, that's part of what made him the, the good carver that he is today. Isn't it? He's now getting near the end of his career. His eyes are not doing well. He doesn't have glaucoma like me, but uh, his eyes are not doing well. And uh, it's not really clear how much how much working time he's got left to be an actual productive carver. So. 
Super nice guy. He's in a little bit of a similar situation to me in that his workshop there, it's in the Shinjuku, it's in the, it's in the backwoods of Shinjuku. He's in Shinjuku-ku, but not near Shinjuku Station. He's in, he's in the backwoods out there. And uh, his real home is out way, 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 way out, like two, three hours by train. Just, so just like me, his home, he's, he's married, he's got a wife. I guess the family and kids are growing up and stuff, but he's got a wife there. His home is out in Sagamihara. And when I visited him yesterday, you know, I go in the door there, and in the back, just behind his bench, there's a, uh, a fton lying on the floor. He crashes there, sleeps there. So his life is just like mine. <laughs> Sleeping on the floor in your, in your office slash workshop, and your home is hours and hours away, and you never get there. And is, it, is it something to do with the... <laughs> I don't... I don't sleepy. Definitely got to be a nap in today's plan somewhere. Checking on the chat here. Some says, why do you work so far from home? It's just circumstance. I know I don't commute, I just sleep here. There's no point in going two hours home to sleep there and come back two hours. It wasn't planned like this. You know. Life just is, yeah, there's no way, the real estate market in Japan being what it is, there's no way I can like sell that house and buy another one closer to my workplace. It's just not possible. When you buy a home in Japan, you're not actually getting equity in it. It's, it's a long story, which we don't need to go into here, but whatever. So my home is what it is. It's located where it is. It was a good idea at the time. I got 15 years living there, beautiful workshop, nice, uh, quiet place by the river. But when the idea came to open the shop, they're two hours apart, but it, it wasn't uh, controllable. So there's no, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter, you know. And it's really sort of the same situation with Asuka-san, I guess. As a, as a freelance carver, he worked for Takamizawa many, many years, as we said, when he, when he became one of their top carvers. And he, had, he worked at home, of course. You don't always need to go downtown for a carver. Your bench can be wherever you are. So he bought the house where it was possible to buy it. Back in the bubble time, buying in central Tokyo was just insanely impossible. So he must have at that time decided, like I did when I bought my house, I could never have bought in central Tokyo. So that's why my house and Asuka Sensei's house are so far out of town. It's all people like us could afford at that time, back to the end of the, uh, the end of the twentieth century. It's different now, but that's what we've that's what we ended up with. So
So if for him and me, there's no sense in commuting. You know, if I had kids and a wife out there or something, then we, this would not be possible. But he and I are both, the, whatever, the family's all grown up, long gone. He's got a wife there, but I guess they've, they've got an accommodation about this. I don't know. I hope so. In my case, it doesn't matter at all. I live alone, so it doesn't matter. You know. And the current situation in Tokyo, I, I'm not the guy to ask, like, what is it currently like in terms of what are, what's people's commuting? What's the average commute now here in Tokyo? Because it's changed dramatically over the years. In the era I'm talking about, the 1980s and so, because land prices were insane, long commutes became the norm for a typical salaryman with a family. It was impossible for them to buy in Tokyo. With the end of the bubble era and the move to the era of no interest rates, and this is about 20 years ago when we moved into the, the 21st century, then it became possible for a salaryman to, to buy uh, an apartment, a condominium type apartment in inside Tokyo because the interest rates were, were so low, still are, they're still extremely low. So there was a boom, quite a boom over the past 20 years of building livable spaces inside Tokyo. We're not talking single-family houses, we're talking you know, developments, you know, you know, condominium towers. And that became the norm then during those years. So many, many young Japanese salarymen now, they're commuting from somewhere inside Tokyo, not two, three hours out. Although that, that, of course, does still exist. All those people who bought those houses during that era still have to make the commute into central Tokyo. So it's a real mix, and it's changed quite a lot over the years. Where it's going now with the depopulation, your guess is as good as mine. I don't know.
I'm sitting here talking to you guys and doing this, you know. And no joke, my ears actually are ringing still from last night's noise. I can hear it right now in my ears. There's a ringing from that freaking concrete drilling last night that was so loud and went on so long. And I'm still got a ringing in my ears from that. That's crazy, absolutely crazy. If I had known it, that really was going to go on that long. You know, like they were all giving us, it'll be finished soon, relax. It's no easy, but it'll be finished soon. They were giving us this line, you know. Those of us who were out there complaining and yelling at them, like, what's going on? Stop this. They're like, oh, it'll soon be over. Don't worry, it'll soon be over. And as I said, it started just after 12, and it finished maybe just before 2 o'clock. If I had known it was actually going to take that long, I should have just bailed out, gone to a hotel or something. I can imagine the tourists who were across the street in the hotel. <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> Have I tried X or Y for my glaucoma? No thanks. Not interested. I don't think it's going to do anything. Okay, that little group's finished. We're next. We're not quite done with this character. His head goes up from here, but we're not done with him yet. His kimono is now done. We've got his hand sitting on the ground here. So let's hit that next. Once we've got his hand done, we'll head up along our journey around the neck to meet up. Look at this thing. <laughs> we'll head up to do his head, meet up with the pipe, and then when that's done, we'll get back to the guy in the middle. <laughs> Actually, this is fun work, you know. This is fun. What the lines represent doesn't really matter. You know, you carve the lines as they are. But it's uh, when the content is 
a little bit fun and off the wall like this. Your work becomes a little bit twisty and fun. Deadline, whatever. We're still in November. <laughs> this print due to be shipped in the first week of January. I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Do my voice sound confident? I think we're okay. <laughs> That's camellia oil, a little dab, a very, very tiny dab of camellia oil. And we don't spread it over the whole surface, just little bit by little bit. Too much of it and the paper will come off the wood. It'll dissolve the glue.
What are we over time? I should keep an eye on what's going on here. What are we? 842. About halfway through. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> questions, questions. The light stanchion across the street is not repaired? No, but actually repair work on the street maintenance has started. You know, the, the uh, when we have the camera pointing the other way, there's the light control box that's got all the stickers outside, and it's been my job to try and keep those things clean. They've all, uh, it's been whatever, either we've they've given up or it's just the cycle time. Those boxes have now all been fenced off. They've been scraped, uh, re, I don't know, they're in the process of repainting. They have a rust-proof undercoat on them at the moment. So if we point the camera the other way, you would see the light box has been renewed. There are four of them down the street. We won't be able to see them from here. No, we can't. We can't see them from here. The other ones are too far down the street. Anyway, the point being, the, there is a round of street maintenance that's happening at the moment. It's starting with those light boxes. It may continue next, the stanchion, maybe next. I don't know. I'm not, in, I'm not part of the committee that arranges these things. I pay my money and I'm part of the group, the merchants group that controls these things, but I'm not involved in the actual day-to-day uh, -day organization of this. How long did it take before Japan felt like home? I don't know, it's a bit funny to answer. You're talking about a guy who, who doesn't have an actual home. When I was young, we moved every two years, so our family doesn't have a... There's the home where we all grew up, and now I'm traveling somewhere else. There is no such feeling for that for me. For me, without being sort of in any way cynical or sarcastic about this, home for me is just it's the place I slept right now I mean home at the moment might as well be this this building but it's a funny thing to say because it's not home I don't have a home in that sense I've got three or four shirts hanging up upstairs you know uh, I've now got four we had three uh, sweatshirts now I've got four Sadako tossed one more into the mix thank you Sadako and I, I don't have like a, a, a closet full of my clothes or a drawer full of my goods and stuff, you know. So whatever, the rambling story, but it doesn't matter. Where I am is what we could essentially just call home. I'm not sure if this print was a bigger size, would it be carved on microscope? I, I'm not sure what to say. I'm using the microscope because I need it. I can no longer see clearly enough without magnifications. So, so I'm not sure what, what to add to that. I don't I now pretty much use the scope all the time, not just for delicate areas of the print. I think if that's the way the question is leading. If I were carving this one again, this print I showed you earlier, if I was carving this, there were no details at all, I could get away with it, I guess. Because it wouldn't matter where your knife was going, and most of it I made up on the spot when I was carving anyway. So something like this you could get away with. And the joke is, this is my future, you know. So suck a work. When I can no longer see clearly, the joke is that I would do work like this. But at the moment, we've got to get this project done and out the door. This is my third one. I'm scheduled to do four. I may be doing five because we've rearranged a little bit the carving assignments for this project. So we'll see. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Somebody was also asking about the long stream, the double stream with Taran San and I. And I guess today, Taran San's been pushing me again. I've been, I guess it's partly procrastination, partly just busyness. I've been again postponing. Let's see, when shall we do this? Taran San really wants to get it organized and he's sent me a couple of emails. He's pushing. So I got to call him up today. 
and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pull the trigger today. We'll decide what to do and we will start making announcements about when to do this. Because for me now to delay much longer, we're going to be ending up in the, in the busy, busy year-end season. So Transan is right. He, I don't know if he's watching the stream this morning, but if you are Transan, let's, uh, let's get in touch this morning. Let's uh, make our decision and pull the trigger and get this going. He sometimes may be a bit frustrated by what he might perceive from me as a lack of action. It's not a lack of action overall, it's a lack of action on what he's looking at. It's not a lack of action all over. So, uh, But I get it, I get it. He's right. We've got to get this thing organized. So. The main decision is whether to do it on a Tuesday when the shop is closed or to do it on one of our normal stream times, which means we would be running into an opening shop. That's the, the last question that needs to be resolved. I think the preference was we liked to do it on a normal stream day starting earlier so people would feel comfortable with what was going on. But that means we're going to run in if we run late or late enough we would run into trouble as the shop opens. But if we do it on Tuesday, that's irrelevant. The place is closed all day long and it wouldn't matter. But I'm thinking with two of us, my God, we're going to kill that thing in a very short time. But having said that, as you guys well know, I am always, always, always over-optimistic with time calculations. Someone's asking about the longer stream. We are absolutely planning on starting it two hours earlier. The current thinking is that we will start at six o'clock Japan time instead of eight as the normal stream. The current thinking is six o'clock Japan time, which really makes it watchable for European viewers as well as North American viewers. Could we just say shop is closed until noon? No, we can't do that. My God, people come to see us. They've come across the planet to come and see us. Excuse me, we're closed this morning. No way. No way, no way, no way. Someone's talking about the, the visit to Mokohankan in the year 201X. How far have we got? Well, it exists. You know, remember, I wrote that before we had a shop, before we had anything. So the big thing does exist. We have a shop here in Tokyo. What's part of that plan? We don't have a cafe, of course, nothing even remotely near it. Uh, what else was in that thing? The library. The library exists in pieces. The library and the collection, those were described in that Mokohankan 20X. They exist in pieces. You could sort of say they are under construction. They're not available to the public. But the thing exists, the, the round big baron that we described on the first page of that, that exists for what it's worth. We have a giant sign outside with a big baron. Uh, but the big thing, the, the public face of Mokohankan does exist and there's many, many, many people pouring through the building every day, finding and enjoying prints. So the core concept of what I outlined in that piece has come to exist. Many of the details are not there. I know. I'm not sure if that's a, a failure or if it's a success. I mean, what can I say? Both things are true, you know. When I wrote that, I knew, of course I knew, that we will never make exactly what I was proposing on paper there. The point being, if you don't have a goal, you're not going to get anywhere. If you have some kind of goal, you're going to get, hopefully, in the right direction, even though you don't get to the same place. So I never expected it all to come to, to fruition exactly as I depicted there. I, nobody should have expected such a thing. Would I like to have 
have made more of that come into view. Would I like to be eating in that cafe lunch today? Yes. Why hasn't it happened? Did I fail or was I projecting too much possible? I don't know. It is very much on my list of things to do to do that again to now write Mokohankan in the year 202x and write the next version of the vision because certainly things here are not the way I, I want them to be happening, you know. I think here we have to take a break for a minute to do some sharpening. The knife has lost its edge here. It's not broken, but the knife has lost its uh, lost its feel. So let's let's clear this patch and then do a bit of sharpening. No, boxwood one knife zero jinai. There's no this the tip is not broken here. I'm not going to use the 400 side. The tip is not broken, just it is simply this is you know whatever when you're in your kitchen too. Your knife doesn't quite cut the tomatoes as well as it did a few minutes ago. Obviously, down to at a, at a very very microscopic level, the, the blade has been been rounded off and worn away. But this is not a fight between the boxwood and the knife. This is simply normal routine. I do. We have our new setup here with tight, tight joints. What have I done here? The new cables are all tight. I reached for the Nagara stone and it went down. Yeah, the next cable up in the sequence is loose. Anyway, sorry, excuse me. So I still don't trust this. I thought we had got all new strong cables here. Still not quite trustable. Okay, anyway, anyway, anyway. I think I got it first time. Mm -hmm. 
Trying to get the light to show. <laughs> Let's zoom in a bit just a second. Let me get the other stone out. That's the 1,000 stone done. Now I'd like to dress it on, on the finishing stone. But that's underneath this cable. Can I do this? Seems okay. This is the finishing stone. I've got no idea what grit it is. It's something in the high thousands. I have no idea. It could be 2,000, 4,000. I have no idea what it is. It's a it's real stone, not a, not a steel stone. And I use it for the last step. I'm sure there are steel stones, diamond grit, whatever, that I could be using for the final polishing. But I just want to keep some semblance of an old-fashioned uh, stone here. This is just final polishing. And the stone itself is so smooth that the only polishing that's being done here is by the nagra, the, the bit of mud that I rubbed on it. So they tell us. It's the, the grit in that mud that does the actual sharpening here. Then the last pull off. Flat back, tip it up, one, two strokes towards myself. And let's see if we can get close enough to see what's going on here. Whether we can focus or not, I don't know. You can see the, the hollow ground back. The back is hollow ground. The edge, the back is shiny. And there should be, there it is. You can see it, the end, edge of the bevel. See the shininess right along the tip. That's the second bevel cut from the back. Then over at the front. Not sure if we can see the two kinds of steel. Not really showing up today. I polished it too much. You should be able to see two kinds of steel, a darker steel and a lighter colored steel. It's, the cutting blade itself is a high carbon steel, very brittle, breaks easily. And backing it is a lower carbon, softer steel, which provides the structural strength to the blade. What's our time? Nine, 900. Nine o'clock on a Thursday, is it? Okay, where are we? Back to my fingers. Actually, looking at it now under the scope, I should have spent more time on the polishing. The last one I can see, still see. You guys probably might have even noticed it. There's a bit of roughness here. This part polished, but this part didn't. I should have spent a bit more time. I think the edge is okay. Not the best sharpening session in the world here. Mm, the edge is sharp though. The edge is sharp. Oh, night and day difference. And uh, Taran and I were when we were planning the upcoming stream. You know the big double stream. 
I was, you know, he and I were chatting about different parts of this, the carving, what to do, pasting down, the hammering, the persuading, all stuff. The sharpening point came up too. And Taran San and I do sharpening a different way. He does it in the, the very much the traditional style. He's got sharpening stones in a bucket by his side. And he turns his whole body to the side and does the sharpening in the traditional side to side pattern. And we chatted about this and it would mean another camera setup. It would mean adjusting this and that. And also he really felt that it would be, you know, not something he wants to do on that stream. So there really isn't much carving. It's a, it's a start to finish stream, but there's really not actual that many square centimeters. So what Tansan is probably going to do, he'll prepare two or three knives. And he'll rotate from one knife to the other during that stream. Dave here, if his knife needs it, will do actual sharpening on stream. And when I was, you know, we were discussing that, gee, that would be okay, but that means that people miss seeing the traditional uh, sharpening stuff. And we realized that that's actually a big deal in itself. So he or I or whatever, we will arrange at a separate time to do a, a video on that because that's something that really, really, really should be uh, brought forward, the traditional carver's way of sharpening these tools. For me, you've seen it now and again on the Twitch streams, now and again it comes up as a little part of a YouTube video, but there's no specific sharpening tutorial. I put a sort of a simple video into my first ebook, you know, Your First Print, but it in no way was a comprehensive tutorial on, on how this is done. So that's still a gap in, our, in the data that we've got put out into the world. And Taran San is the guy to fill that gap. But we will. It's, it's a, a high priority on our list of things to do for upcoming video projects. And the best way to do it, I think, would be to do it with Taran San, but not here. Go over to Asuka Sensei's place. You know, the gentleman I talked to earlier in this stream and do a video using Asuka Sensei and then Taran San and maybe myself, maybe, you know, show me how to do it, sir. And we might make a video over there doing that. That's what really needs to be put out into the world so people can see clearly. There's a few uh, glimpses of it in the video I did remembering the carver, the one with you know, Ito-san. There's just a few seconds but it wasn't set up properly for video. The cameraman couldn't see anything except the guy's back. So trust me a little bit. We are on this. We realize that that's a bit of a hole in our data that we have put out into the world. And uh, we'll cover it. We'll cover it when, whenever we can. I say we, and it's going to have to be we, because I don't, uh, I don't know how to do that. You know? I know how it works. I've seen it many times. I understand the concepts, but I myself haven't trained myself to do that. So I'm not the guy to sit there and demonstrate, demonstrate the classical ukiyo-e sharpening technique. You know? And I'm not sure it'll make any difference anyway, because even if we do put the information out there, it's not like anybody out there is going to switch over and start using this, because it's, uh, it's not simple at the beginning. It's really not simple. You're going to screw it up and screw it up some more, and then you're going to screw it up some more. And even when you think you're getting good at it, you're going to screw it up some more. It's difficult. And when you finally got it under your belt and you've been doing it well, then you're good to go. But as long as you keep in condition and practice, it really isn't difficult. Uh, it really isn't easy, but it's extremely efficient for a full-time practicing go-go carver. Anyway, coming not soon to a, a YouTube channel near you.
questions and answers. I see the mods have been busy answering stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you, gang. Did Dave share what print will be carved by Taran and him? Actually, the, the, the situation is still in flux. Oh, are you talking about the, the stream start to finish? No, we haven't shared that yet. I thought you were talking about one of the prints in the Hokusai series. Sorry. No, I know we did hint about it. It's the same designer as the previous start to finish stream. You know, the girl in the bath. Taran-san hunted around and came up with a reasonably interesting design by the same artist. And he's thinking of this as a pair. I don't know if it really works as a pair, but uh, so don't worry about it. Just sit tight and you'll see it as it happens. Because it's two of us, there are more colors. That other one that I did was two one color block and one black block. This one has <coughs> five faces. So he and I, over the course of the session, will be sharing the work on five block faces. He's been preparing the tracings, getting them ready.
Is there a background conversation going on here? Yes. Yep, it's show and tell time. Okay. Today's show and tell different for a few reasons. I have to be a bit careful. In the show and tell package today, we haven't opened this yet. This is a package. I know some of you may have seen this before. Some of you guys are are hunting and searching in Yahoo Auctions. And this is a package we got from Yahoo Auctions, not from our dealer contacts. So there will be people out here who have seen that. They will have thought, that looks nice. Shall I bid on that or shall I not bid on that? I don't remember the exact situation. Maybe we were the only ones who bid on this, I think. I can't remember. Because this was a strange and unusual auction. And the dealer, either the dealer was uh, simply he didn't know what he had. He described it as Utamaro woodblock prints, blah, 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 blah. Either he didn't know what he had or he's a conniving thief, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Looking at the pictures, it was pretty clear that these were not Utamaro woodblock prints. But they were really interesting. So there's one, one point too. Among the four pictures that were part of this auction, one of them is not safe for work. Now I haven't opened this yet. I'm going to open it a little bit carefully so that we don't get any surprises. I don't want to make trouble with the Twitch Terms of Service and I don't want to make trouble with anybody here. So as we start to open this and unwrap it, I may, a little, I may be a little bit coy here as I'm unwrapping it to make sure that we don't suddenly uh, break our Terms of Service or make trouble for you. There are four items in here. One of them is that type. And as soon as I can identify it, I'll put it aside so that we can easily look at the other prints which are safe. So just so you know. Now that may have given it away. Some of you in here may have been looking at these auctions. And you may have seen this one. And if you know anything about woodblock prints, you would have looked closely at the images and said, ha, those are not woodblock prints. even though they were described as such. But they are really, really, really interesting. And I was thinking, whatever, I would like to see these things. I would like to see how this person has made these things. I would like to see how they're done. And at the end of the day, maybe I will keep one for my collection as an example of the kind of thing that could happen. And then we can maybe put the rest in the shop. Because I think they will be of interest to people, although we would have to clearly mark them. These are not Mocha Hong Kong's typical woodblock prints. And we're not talking about the octopus. And nudity in art may be allowed. This is, one of these prints has a quite vivid depiction of a, a sex act. So we won't be looking at that one front and center on the stream here. For those of you who know the terminology, there is a shunga print in here. If I can just get in here. How are we gonna, I should tell you what, forget about the tape, just if only I had a knife. Let's just do this, let's just slice our way in. Does somebody know about the auctions? Let's see. It looks like we're looking at the raw things themselves. And seeing from the back, right away we can see this is not a woodblock print. Okay, as I said, I've got to be coy for a minute. Let me see if I can take one of them out of here. Oh, it's the top one. So it would be the top one, wouldn't it? So just a sec. Let me re-roll this just a second. Keeping the world safe for you and your children. Okay, so let's put that one aside. 
And now let's have a look at the other three. <coughs> now these are really, really tightly rolled. Even just by re-rolling them there, this guy should not have rolled these. My God. Oh. Okay, what we have is an auction which he described as three Utamaro woodblock prints. And they are huge. They are big, 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 as in huge. And they're rolled so super tightly. brushing everywhere there's brushing everywhere I can see the marks of the brush the dab of a paintbrush the waveliness of the lines yeah it's all done by hand it's all brushed by hand with some kind of strange ink on some kind of strange paper it is incredibly close to the original it's astonishing <laughs> the size of this thing. Those of you who know Utamaro woodblock prints, this is double or, or more size. And this person has done an astonishing job. An absolutely astonishing job. I, it's so tight, I cannot... Can we get into the hair here somewhere? It's a painting. It's a painted reproduction of an Utamaro print. And what it looks like here, the, the color you're seeing on her face, I don't think that's paint. This is painted on. That yellowish color, I believe, is the base color of the paper. And then the hairs, of course, are painted on one by one. Then the face color is painted. And then the eyes also are painted in. This person has done an astonishing job of this. It's absolutely superbly done. It's a copy of a Utamaro woodblock print. And the person, I don't even know, how did they get the, the thing onto the paper to do the drawing? I don't know. Look at the brushwork. And then the lettering. Can I get up to the lettering here? Somewhere has a lettering. Look at this. This is not a woodblock print. This is drawn. Someone says, any guess about the age? I have no idea. It doesn't seem ancient. It doesn't seem Meiji. I would, whatever. The paper, it's the paper is some kind of like, like construction paper. It's not Japanese washi, it's a, it's a Western paper. You can see, look at the edge here. They've, they've painted around past the edge. Maybe with the intention that this was going to be framed. The kimono pattern is done with white pigments on top. It's so well done. It's just beyond belief. So I couldn't resist buying this. You know. Ken-san, good morning. Oh my God, is it that time already? Let me see if I can find the auction page here. Hang on a sec. What did we pay for it? How far back was this? 6,500 yen. And nobody else bid, so nobody else bid on it. 
because people were thinking clearly this is not a woodblock print. There's the option, and there's four of these. Can I open these others without damaging them? Let's try the next one. Sure, this, this is hard to do. These are big. So what I was thinking was maybe we'll keep one of these for the collection, maybe, as an example of the kind of thing that can be done. Maybe we'll put the rest in the shop, I don't know. There is a little bit of uh, aging here. Is it foxing or something? I'm not sure. Do you see on the pigments here? There's bits and bits of brown spots. It doesn't look like it's on the paper. It looks like it's in the pigment. I can't tell. This person has got some really good sense for this. They have replicated this astonishingly well. Good morning, Urugawa-san. Hello. This is incredible. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> I'm having trouble holding it for you. I'm sorry. This is incredible. The, the, the way that the guy's done the taste of the lines, every line is just in the right place, has the right mood, has the right taste. Incredible, incredible, incredible. That's two of them. So if they're rolling themselves all around here, let's try and see the next one. Okay, we've got some aging problems here. He's used a white pigment for some of this. It seems that maybe it has aged in a way that some of it is browner than the rest of it. I don't know. Look at this. There's no way he would have painted it with such a white stripe there. So some of this has uh, either oxidized or has had some kind of reaction to time. And there's a bit of goldy colored stuff in the thing at the back, the hair fan. I don't know if you can see it. You see, there's a bit of bling here. Some saying silk screen. This seems to be, and again, looking at this, they seem to be hand drawn. The colors definitely are done by hand, and the lines themselves, yeah, it's hand drawn, absolutely. Every line here is hand drawn. When you get close enough, you can see the waveriness of the brush. Somebody has taken a replicas of Utamaro prints and by hand has, look at it here, look at this. So I'm very, very happy. This is not our normal show and tell. This is not the normal stuff we pick up on auctions. But I just could not let this go by. Even though it was clear these were not woodblock prints, I could not resist getting this. What did I say it was? 6,500 yen? That's like $40 US right now? I mean, give me a break. $10 each for these. I think we can manage that for our budget. <laughs> not sure what to do with them. Step one is going to try, try to get them to lay flat. We may take them upstairs, lay them on a board, spray the back lightly with water. I think we can get away with that. We'll test one corner first. Just dampen it and then flatten it between some very, very large boards. Okay, there we have it. I think this is one of the most unusual show and tells we've ever seen here. I really don't want to show you the fourth one because it is, it's an open shingle picture. It's a depiction of explicit sex. It's probably best just to leave that off.
somebody who understands brush strokes. Hey, real fun, real fun. I can't, uh, I'm going to have to let this roll up because I can't pull it over. There. Maybe if I put that, put that in, put something. Put the other one, I don't have anything else. Okay, we'll leave it there, guys. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much. A little bit of a special show. Oh, yeah, you've seen the auction page. Okay, if you want to look at the other picture, go to the auction link that I gave you. And you can see the fourth print there. He's actually covered it up. The people in auctions sometimes do this. They're a little bit worried about putting explicit pictures in the Yahoo auction website. So they will take a coin or something and cover up the picture in the auction. And I think that's what the guy has done here. He's blacked it out. Anyway, there we go. Let's put up the outside camera. Today is Thursday. I'll be back here two days from now. You know exactly what I will be doing. This is our cold hot towel delivery. Look at that sunshine. I know it's blowing out the camera because the camera's pointed at a dark place, but it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sunny day today here in Asakusa. No cone alignment, but can't have everything all at the same time. Okay, guys, thanks very much. I'll see you on Saturday morning. Bye for now. Oh, look out for the announcement about the upcoming stream. Taransan and I are going to decide it today. I'll put the first announcement on Instagram. We'll be talking about it here on Saturday, announcing what's going on. Okay, thanks very much. Life now. No masks. Look at this. Japanese people walking around with no masks. What is the world coming to? Three, two, one.